Good morning. My name is Mark Peterkins, and on behalf of the Ottawa Civic Prayer Breakfast organizing team, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our live virtual event. We know many of you have lots of virtual meetings, and so we are honored that you join us this morning. I hope you have some coffee and maybe a bowl of oatmeal. Lean in and enjoy. I'd like to welcome some special guests, Fire Chief Kim Ayot, City Councilors Keith Egli, Matthew Flurry, Riley Brockington. Welcome to all of you. Just a reminder, the purpose of the prayer breakfast is to honor the Lord, to thank and pray for the civic leaders and first responders, to be a catalyst for better neighboring in our church and city leadership by highlighting city church partnerships, to help the church celebrate Jesus' presence in the different expressions of our Christian faith. Although this event is free, there are costs to run it. So thanks to our sponsors who have helped cover this event, many who have helped for years now. I'm just gonna quickly mention who they are. Active Care Physio, Career Joy, Chartwell Retirement Residence, CHRA Family Radio, Embassy Connections, Floyd Real Estate Team, More Than Enough, Manatic Tree Movers, McAvoy Shields, The Wood Source, and Welch LLP. If you'd like to contribute to the cost of the event, there is a donation button on your screen and we welcome any contributions. Now at the end of our program, there'll be an optional live Q&A time with our main speaker, Nigel Paul. You'll notice a question tab on your screen. Please feel free to send any questions uh, at any time for Nigel. And now our, uh, our morning will start now with a message from our Mayor of Ottawa, Jim Watson. Hi, I'm Jim Watson, Mayor of the City of Ottawa, and it's my pleasure to virtually welcome everyone at the 11th Annual Civic Prayer Breakfast. Despite not being able to meet in person, I'm happy to see that you can still come together virtually to pray and recognize our city's first responders. As you know, our city's essential and frontline emergency and medical personnel have been working extra hard to keep our community safe and healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm so proud of the healthcare workers, protective service workers, grocery store workers, janitor and maintenance workers, and many, many others. They all deserve our gratitude and our prayers. Finally, please enjoy the virtual breakfast, and I hope to see you all in person next year. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much. God bless. Merci beaucoup. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. We worship you for your glory, your splendor, your beauty and majesty. You are the creator and the designer. You are purposeful. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth in Ottawa as it is in heaven. We thank you for your righteousness, for your justice and your love and kindness, for righteousness exalt a nation. We thank you, Lord, for our mayor, Jim Watson. We thank you for your grace upon his life. We thank you for our police chief, Peter Sole. Thank you for our general manager, Anthony DeMonte, and the fire chief, Kim Ayote. We want to thank you for our paramedic chief, Miles Cassidy. Thank you, Father, for our bylaw chief, Roger Chapman. We want to thank you for the accomplishment you have helped our mayor to bring about in our city. There has been incredible infrastructural development in our city. Although we are confounded and confronted with the pandemic, Lord, we thank you for your grace and your help over our city. I want to pray that you help our mayor to identify and accept and walk in wise counsel. Give him Daniels who would stand around him and speak into the mystery of the season and the times. I pray that you release upon him your grace for leadership. Thank you, Father, because you are doing amazing things in the life of our mayor. Thank you for the spirit of discretion. Thank you for foresight. I ask that you surround him with the Josephs who are able to be strategic into the future of our great city. I pray, O oh God, that you equip our mayor to act according to your will and make him to have choices that are pleasant to you. When he stumbles, give him the courage to admit his mistakes and strengthen his character. Guard him against hurtful compromises. I pray in the name of Jesus that you surround our mayor and our city with your angel of protection. We thank you and we worship you. We thank you, Lord, because you are the supreme judge and ruler over all. And so we pray for every judge in the, our courtroom around our city. We pray for their salvation and ultimate submission to you so that they can understand the principles of justice, mercy, and grace. Lord, we honor you. Give them wise hearts and designing minds. 
that will interpret truth and uphold your law. Father, I pray for the families of all of these ones in our city. Would you protect them? Would you defend them? Grant them peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Isaac. Um, just want to mention there's a bookmark on the Ottawa Civic Prayer Breakfast under bookmark that can be printed and tucked into a Bible or held close by you so you can be praying for our city officials. They're listed by name on that, that bookmark. Now, um, it is our pleasure to hear from the Ottawa Police Services at our breakfast, and that continues uh, this year with this pre-recorded segment. It is my great pleasure to welcome back uh, Constable Kevin Graham to the Ottawa Civic Prayer Breakfast. And um, uh, Constable, how has it been for you guys? Part of, part of the Civic Prayer Breakfast's passion is to be praying for and encouraging our, our first responders. And obviously, police force is a big, big part of that. And so uh, give us an update. How's it been for you guys during the uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic? Yeah, so the one thing that hasn't changed is the fact that we are still answering calls for service. We're still out there. Um, assisting the members of the community. Um, I, the only difference is, is that we have a lot more protective gear that we have to enter into these environments with because they, they may be affected with COVID-19. And uh, the one thing that we have to change with our mindset is, is that some of the environments that we do enter into are positive for COVID-19. So that being said, um, we still attend as we do with any other call, um, but it does it's extend past just the workplace. We have families at home, like everyone else, that needs to be taken care of. And uh, we have to take uh, additional measures um, entry into our homes. So the other thing that has been going on, particularly through the summer, is that uh, our whole country, our whole world really, has been having more discussions about race and uh, Black Lives Matter and all that kind of thing. As a, as a black man and as a police officer, where you might fall on both sides of some of these discussions, how? How have you managed that personally? That would be... Uh... Yeah, I, I tell people uh, for the most part, you know, for the most people I talk to, I tell them the first thing is that I'm a, I'm a black man, I'm a member of the black community that is a police officer. So primarily I'm a member of the black community. So I feel the pain of the black community as we all, all the black officers do. Um, uh, not only do I feel it, but I've faced some of these issues myself. Um, and in saying that, um, I'm, as a police officer, um, there's ways that we have to deal with these situations um, to ensure that not only the community is protected, but we're protected as police officers as well. There's been a lot of communication over the summertime about you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, the social injustice, the, uh, the racial concerns, and um, you know, it's seen. It's seen, it's heard, we, we know it's there. It's just acknowledging where it is and how we can affect the change. I'm a big proponent of education. Um, I believe that it is my responsibility as a black uh, person to begin a path of education for people who don't understand. Um, but I also believe that it's necessary for the people who don't understand, if they, they're seeing what's going on, they believe that there is an injustice, to take that time to educate themselves as well. You, you've mentioned a few things that we can be praying about. Is there anything, anything else that we can be praying about for, for you and the police services uh, as part of the church here in the city? Uh, I think it's just the regular things that we've um, always discussed. Again, mental health um, is, a, is a big thing. We see a lot of things. Uh, we go through a lot of things. We have to deal with a lot of things that the general public would never, ever know of and would never see themselves. Um, and not only from the aspect where we're directly affected, but some of the things where the community is affected. And, um, you know, it hurts us as well. Um, you know, uh, children passing away, shootings, um, overdoses, uh, suicides, those are things that weigh heavily on us and some of us have uh, some sleepless nights when, when we see these type of things happen. So, um, you know, praying for our mental health um, and then also praying for the wisdom. I think, um, again, we have different communities out there. We have the black community, we have the LGBTQ, we have indigenous community and so many more that we need to have the wisdom and understanding of how to deal with each, uh, each community. We are all people. Amen, thank you. Well, on, uh, on behalf of the church in the city and also um, the residents of the city, we want to thank you. We want to thank you and uh, the whole police services that you represent to us here this morning for serving and loving this community the way you guys do. Uh, 
and for you in particular as you do that in Jesus name. So God bless you, my brother. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of the Ottawa Police Service, we thank you guys as well for, and everyone for praying for us and covering us in that, that prayer is definitely something that's needed. Whether you know, we, we see the big guy or not, it's definitely something that's needed to be covered. Thank you. Our thanks to Kevin again for participating with us uh, again this morning. Now I'd like to introduce um, Carolyn De La Foresta. She serves as the lead for the Almont Country Haven, one of our long-term facilities that was much in the news earlier in the pandemic. My name is Carolyn De La Foresta and I'm the administrator of Almont Country Haven. I have had the great honor of working in long-term care for over 29 years and I consider it my daily blessing to care for my seniors. I worked through SARS and H1N1, and now, sadly, I'm working through COVID. Nothing in all of my years of service, though, could have prepared me for the current crisis that we are facing. In long-term care, due to the nature of the care we provide and the length of time that our residents live with us, we form incredible bonds, and they become our family. We also get to know their extended family as well. But we are aware that we can't replace family. And in March, the Chief Medical Health Officer of Ontario made the decision to close all long-term care homes to visitors. Our families and our residents lost the personal connection of seeing one another face to face, and only two weeks later, we went into a full COVID outbreak. Unfortunately, our building is over 40 years old and is built to the old design standards. Therefore, over half of our residents live together in what's called ward accommodation with up to four people living in one bedroom together. We didn't have the ability to construct an infirmary and separate the sick residents from the well residents. We were the first home in this region to be hit with a COVID outbreak and one of the first homes in Ontario and this is one of the times where being first out of the gate is not a good thing. The health authorities did not have the information back in March and April that they do today on COVID. And the information that they provided and the guidance and direction they provided to fight the virus sometimes changed on a daily basis. And this was truly frustrating and frustrating to our best efforts. With a long-term care home outbreak, what they do is they test three residents. And once those results are back, they then assume what the outbreak is. So with three of our residents testing positive for COVID, no other residents were tested. It was over four weeks before all of our residents were finally tested and over five weeks before all of our staff were tested. Interestingly enough, 27% of both our positive resident and staff population were all asymptomatic, including myself. We had no idea we had the virus because it never developed in our system. So we were truly fighting an invisible beast. We're accustomed to loss in long-term care, but not loss of this magnitude and not loss at this rapid rate. Despite our best efforts in infection control measures, 72 of our 82 residents tested positive and 29 succumbed. In April, the Ontario Funeral Service Association made the decision that funeral home personnel would not come into the homes, but instead the long-term care staff would have to deliver the residents out to the hearse. Not only were we caring for our residents as they died and preparing their bodies afterwards, but now we had to close the bag. And I don't think any of us were prepared for the emotions of zipping that bag closed on our dear residents. Last year, I went through my own very difficult health journey and early into our outbreak, I brought my cancer quilt into the home because I wanted to lovingly place it over all of our residents as they left our front doors. And as was our custom, we would walk out of the home together as a group on either side of the stretcher. And one day when we walked out, all of us were wiping tears and I could see this lady's granddaughter in the parking lot and she had her hand on her heart and suddenly she stretched her arms out towards us and then she pulled them in tight, wrapping herself in a hug. And I knew she was hugging her grandma, and I knew she was also hugging us. Not only were we fighting the virus, but we also suddenly had to quarantine 82 residents to their bedrooms, which was incredibly difficult, given the cognition level of many of them. We also had to develop a system overnight to deliver 82 meals to residents' bedrooms, which is completely foreign to us as we deal with dining room service. So all resident movement within the home ceased and they lost their connection with their fellow residents. And 
We watched helplessly as we were running, trying to take care of their medical needs. We were also trying to care for their emotional and social needs within their bedrooms, but it was incredibly difficult as their movement stopped, their daily activities stopped, which all provided connections for them. And sadly, the weeks in isolation have absolutely affected their physical abilities as well as their cognitive abilities. As we fought the virus inside of our walls, we were also fighting an external losing battle, and that was the battle of the media. They invaded our privacy in terrible ways, coming on our property, accosting our staff as they tried to walk into the building. They published incredibly inaccurate information, very damaging information that was not just about our home, but about long-term care as well. And it was, it was further demoralizing and hurtful to all of us as we were dealing with very fragile mental health given what we were watching and experiencing inside of our home. This uneducated, uneducated and, and cruel reporting, it left us heartbroken. And one day my pastor said to me, Carolyn, you're going to have to walk with a thick skin but continue to lead with your tender heart. As our residents' health declined, we did our absolute best to be there for them when their family couldn't be. And none of us wanted our residents to be alone in their time of need. So we would all take turns staying with them in their bedrooms, sitting beside their beds, holding their hands, reading scripture, singing songs, wiping their forehead and whispering words of comfort. We had staff that would come in on their days off and staff that would stay late well beyond their shift because none of us could see them be alone in that time. For weeks on end, we all felt that we were on a treadmill that was going mock speed and we just couldn't get off. Not only was I dealing with a work crisis, but I was also dealing with a family crisis. My husband who works downtown Ottawa with a vulnerable population, he sadly contracted the virus as well and ended up hospitalized. One of our 16 year old twin sons also tested positive for COVID. At no point did any of us have the opportunity to take the mental health break and pause the way that we needed to. And I was so concerned that if I actually did pause and try and unpack my feelings and my emotions, that I would be a puddle on the floor and you might not be able to get me back up. Through all of this darkness though, we did see incredible glimpses of beauty and our community surrounded us and supported us in ways that we never imagined but God did. And I rest in the assurance that he knows from beginning to end. And I believe as leaders at this time, that it's time for us to lead with boldness and with courage. I believe that we need to demonstrate understanding and compassion and above all else, I believe that we all need to show one another grace. What an amazing story. Uh, Carolyn mentioned to us how much her team sacrificed in order to serve their community. For example, one of their young mothers chose to send her husband and two-year-old to live with his parents for a period of time. Another young lady lived in a trailer on the property, uh, and she was newly pregnant at that time, and had to leave behind a 16-month month daughter and uh, husband in order to keep working. Uh, truly heroes in our midst. Now, uh, Sarah Jackson with Pray Ottawa, We'll pray for our first responders and our medical personnel. We are going to take some time to pray for our medical personnel, like Carolyn, and our first responders. So we're praying for medical personnel and PSWs, praying for police officers, bylaw officers, 911 dispatch, firefighters, paramedics. And uh, after hearing Carolyn's sharing and the other sharing we've heard so far, I think it would be good to start with just a, a little bit of quiet and then I'll be praying. Please pray with me that I'm not the only one praying here, but please engage and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the people that you have given us who care for us in such professional ways, in a variety of ways, in our times of great need. And over the last eight months in particular, they have been through such enormous strain, um, as all of us have, but in their roles, it has been even greater. And so we would ask you to replenish them 
in every place they're stretched too thin. Anyone who's injured, either physically or emotionally, that you would relieve their distress and you would heal their bodies and their spirits. And as they go forward from this time, would you equip them, Lord? We trust that you have an equipping for us that is supernatural. And we pray that you would equip them, their decisions that are complex and sometimes need to be instant, you would guide those decisions. That their equipment would be the right equipment and it would be working properly. That their supplies would be sufficient. That they would always have the communication between one another and up and down the chain of command that helps them do the best job they can with the talents that you've given them. That you would restore them at home in their relationships if they are married with their spouse, with their children. That you would give them the words they need to share what they have. Lord, we thank you for them and we earnestly pray that they would be in your care as they care for us. You know their needs and we thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Um, allow me to uh, now introduce one of our local move-in teams. You're going to hear more about move-in here in a second. But they call themselves a patch, and they serve in the uh, Caldwell area. Patrick, Sarah, uh, Stephanie, and Faye. And, uh, and now here's a little of their story as they neighbor in their community. There have been a lot of experiences um, that I've had in this neighborhood that has, have really opened up my eyes to how much God loves and sees each one of us. Um, just one that comes to mind is uh, <laughs> earlier last summer when I was doing one of my daily walks to um, <laughs> the Walmart nearby, I bumped into a, a lady that had um, she had a baby with her and she was she looks a little bit lost and was asking for directions and uh, I am terrible with directions so my first thought was I need to find someone else to have, that can help you. <laughs> um, but I have a uh, phone, I looked up the address where she was going to and she explained that she was buying something um, that was a little bit large so I thought well you're here with a baby um, and she didn't expect anyone to not only just stop on the street to give her directions but to walk to the destination to her she was completely floored um, it really touched her heart that parable of, of the good samaritan um yeah and just that i think that's something i've been i've been thinking through and wrestling with even since moving to caldwell um yeah, and, and feeling somewhat of a gap between, I guess, the neighbors I thought I was going to get to know and the neighbors that, that God is putting in my life to get to know. And I think God's readjusting my focus toward uh, the people who I am in contact with. Uh, so I work um, as a nurse in harm reduction. So a lot of my clients are addicted to drugs. They struggle with mental health challenges. Um, many of the women are in sex work. Um, a lot of these issues are present within this neighborhood itself. And uh, one thing that God's been doing within COVID is actually really mingling my work in this neighborhood together, um, which has created an open door um, into like reaching greater networks in Caldwell um, that are struggling with drug addiction um, and opening doors into women that are in sex work in which is an area that we've been praying into for two years. In the middle of uh, one of my just sort of normal commutes I was 
taking a moment in February to enjoy some of the sunshine, which is difficult in Ottawa because it's quite cold, and just felt God's presence in that moment. And I turned, um, and with feeling the heat and the promise of spring coming, um, I turned to a, a lady who was hijabed at the bus stop and I said, what a beautiful day. There's a promise of spring in the air. And that started an over six year relationship. And uh, recently um, she was able to join us and uh, I was able to meet her first daughter. And so I just think it's beautiful how yeah, just a moment of obedience um, starts relationship and someone who one moment wasn't your neighbor becomes your neighbor and then your friend. All right, so I'm going to be reading for you three different translations of different verses. And I'm going to start out with reading from John chapter 1, verse 14 in the New King James Version. And it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now in the message version, just to give you a bit of a different translation, it says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And then lastly here, I'm going to read for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Good morning. I'm looking forward to introducing our guest speaker. And before I do that, I'm just saying how much I miss you in person. But that'll happen again next year. And uh, for now, we're so grateful for this opportunity for the next hour to uh, just be uh, inspired by some great presentations. Uh, our speaker today, uh, most notably, is connected with a beautiful family. His wife, Jessie, uh, is a talented and gifted nurse uh, in Toronto. And uh, they have two children, Courage, age three, and uh, Christian, age one. And they're just a beautiful family. I first met Nigel in 2007, and uh, we were at a house meeting in Mississauga. George Verwer, the uh, founder of Operation Mobilization, uh, was present uh, along with Nigel and myself and several others. And it was just great to hear um, George Verwer, uh, 83 years old now, still active as a global di discipler. And you can tell the, the impact that he's had on Nigel's life. And uh, so that was 2007, 2009, Nigel launched Move In. You're going to hear a lot about that in Nigel's presentation, I'm sure. Uh, just a tremendous ministry, and I was privileged to be on the board there for several years. And uh, the other things in Nigel's involved in, he's involved in an uh, entrepreneurial enterprise called Toi Assistant. He's definitely a tent maker, just like Paul was. And, uh, and George and, um, and Nigel remind me so much of Paul and Timothy in the Bible. And so it's just, uh, just a, a terrific impact on Nigel's life and ministry through uh, George Verwer. The other thing Nigel does, he uh, gives leadership to a local church in Toronto with a move-in group called uh, uh, Malcosa, Malcosa. And so there's much to say about Nigel, great man of character, and um, just, just compassionate about people, um, a great leader, uh, tremendous composure in everything that he does. He's a visionary, he has courage, he takes risks, um, but uh, his love for people, love for Christ, is what really stands out about Nigel. So, great pleasure for me to introduce a friend, more like a son to me at times, Nigel Paul. Wow, well, it's so good to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you all of you for joining us at the Ottawa Civic Prayer Breakfast. Thank you, Mark, for your leadership, the one-way team. So good to hear from the mayor and uh, police leadership, to hear about first responders, to hear about long-term care in Ottawa and across the country. Also such a joy to hear from the move-in team there in Caldwell, Faye and Patrick, 
uh, Sarah and Stephanie. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for reading those scriptures and Jerry for that generous introduction. It really is a privilege to be with you this morning. Thanks for waking up early. I do hope, as Mark said earlier, that you have a coffee there. I know I have had that and um, just grateful for the little blessings in life, especially at this time. Thank you, Jessica, for reading that passage. John 1, 14. Many of us have heard it before. It rings, it rings a bell. John 1, 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the message paraphrase puts it so poignantly. The word became flesh and blood and moved in to the neighborhood. And then 2 Corinthians 8, 9 again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. In early 2009, God gave me a vision. He actually gave me two words, and you might have guessed what those two words are, move in. It was a vision to see thousands of regular Christians prayerfully moving in among the unreached urban poor around the world. I remember being so excited about what God was downloading to me and I was meeting up with people one at a time for coffee or for lunch and just sharing my heart, sharing this vision. Hey, why don't we move into neighborhoods of need? Why don't we pause before we move somewhere and, and maybe challenge our defaults because so often we move into the nicest neighborhoods we can afford. But what if we paused and asked ourselves, what if I do maybe the opposite of that? What if I look at the neighborhoods across my city and say, where might God use me? As humble and simple as I am, where might God want me? Could he use me to touch somebody's life? And so that was the vision for teams of regular people, students and people with jobs to relocate into some of the priority neighborhoods in our, in our cities across Canada and across the world to live our lives and to be committed to prayer, prayer, to pray weekly as teams. And so I was sharing this with one person at a time. And then I thought, you know what, maybe we should put a few people in a room and share this vision with more than one person. And I think I was originally thinking 30 or 40 people, maybe in a side room of a church. And this vision grew as well. And I chose a date a few weeks out. It was early 2009, chose a date in May. And when this event happened, 600 people came. And it was just such an incredible thing God was doing. And this was the launch event of Move In. It's special to be with you in virtually in Ottawa today because Ottawa uh, was uh, the first city tied with Toronto where Move In began. And I remember I was speaking on a weekly basis in different churches at that time. I was 27 years old uh, then. I'm a little older now. And in the different churches where I was speaking, I would often ask the congregations, let's pray for some young people in Ottawa who are looking to move in to some high needs neighborhoods in Ottawa. And I would pause while speaking in different churches and together with the congregations, we would pray for young people like those we saw earlier in this breakfast, sharing their testimonies. Um, at that time in late 2009, there were some young people who were, who were couch surfing and waiting for God to give them the chance to move in to one of these neighborhoods, neighborhoods like Lower Town and Caldwell and Ritchie and Hetherington and other neighborhoods there in Ottawa. And God answered prayer. Miracles happened where housing that we never thought we could get access to, God opened up. And these young people, uh, simple students, regular young people, began moving into these neighborhoods and being a humble, prayerful presence in these neighborhoods. Thank you again, Faye, Patrick, Sarah, and Stephanie, for sharing your testimonies about your presence in Caldwell there in Ottawa. So the vision kept growing. 
And after that conference with 600 people, um, more and more groups of young people began to, more, began to move into more and more neighborhoods of need across Canada and across the world. I wish I could tell you all the stories of this spreading vision. Uh, it spread to the UK and to Sweden. Today, we are in Mexico and Chile and Brazil, Indonesia, the Philippines, and several other countries around the world. In fact, we've grown to 95 teams, 430 people, 350 of which are adults and 80 of which are kids. And we consider the kids in our movement full moveners as much as their parents. We all have weekly prayer meetings in our neighborhoods, and we join with our neighbors to see transformation take place in these neighborhoods through the loving power of God. Prayer is one of our commitments. We've already heard mention today of something that we didn't expect early in this year of 2020, which was the pandemic. And it was so moving, especially to hear earlier in the breakfast from um, the leadership of the long-term care home. There have been so many heartbreaking things that have taken place. And yet God is at work in unique ways, in ways that he couldn't have been at work without the pandemic. I remember early on, especially as we in Move In feel called to the poor in the world, you know, recognizing that, as usual, the poor would be hardest hit by this emergency. We have an event in Move In called the Prayer Journey, and it's a single day in, in the year, in mid-June, when we, uh, in small, uh, nondescript groups, prayerfully walk through neighborhoods of need around the world, praying for um, humble, loving, prayerful believers to move in to those neighborhoods around the world. And when the pandemic hit earlier this year, we wondered if we could go ahead with this event, uh, the prayer journey. And as we took it to God, he, he directed us, yes, we should continue with it. And in fact, we should use it this year especially to uh, highlight the needs of the global poor. And in my role as the leader of Move In, I asked God, Lord, how do you want me to model um, shining a light on the needs of the poor around the world? And the Lord asked me to do something that I found pretty intimidating, which was to uh, run a full marathon on my balcony. I live on the 12th floor of a high rise in Toronto. There are almost a thousand people that live in my building. I live in a neighborhood that's just 400 by 400 meters, the size of a large parking lot. And in that area are four 24 story high rise buildings, almost 4,000 people. And the Lord led me to train for, and I didn't have much time, and I'd never run a marathon before, a full marathon on my balcony. It was quite a task uh, carrying that treadmill up and getting it on the balcony. We raise, event, raise funds through the prayer journey. And this year, we decided to raise funds for others. And so we had a project uh, where we hoped we would raise $50,000 that we would send to other ministries around the world who were um, helping the global poor in different countries all across the world. And wow, did God work through this event. We hoped to raise $50,000 we saw $134,000 come in. And we have had the privilege of sending that out across the world to make some kind of a difference among the global poor. We also, as, as I shared in the vision of Move In, have the privilege of living in our neighborhoods of need across the world, in Ottawa, in Hamilton, in Surrey, BC, in Regina, Saskatch Regina, Saskatchewan, and uh, across Alberta, and Nova Scotia, and across the country, and into the US and around the world. And it's a chance for us, despite our own challenges in the pandemic, despite the restrictions we're each facing in the pandemic, to look around us 
and to notice the needs of our neighbors. I want to encourage you as well in your neighborhood. Right now, you may find yourself really struggling. If you're a young parent, you may be experiencing childcare challenges. I know that's the case for my wife, Jessie, and I. And as Jerry mentioned in the introduction, uh, my wife, Jessie, is a nurse. And so she's been uh, serving as a nurse in one of the uh, hospitals in Toronto that at times has had COVID outbreaks. And on top of that, like everybody else, we're, we're, we're uh, dealing with childcare uh, challenges. And how do, how do we deal with all these things? How does each of us um, manage all of the restrictions that we're all facing? And yet, despite those challenges that each of us is facing, and uh, despite um, feeling stretched at times in our mental health, in our emotional state, in our relationships, I want to encourage you to also pause and look out and to notice those around you and to notice your neighbor. I find it striking that the second greatest commandment that Jesus uh, reiterated after loving God, is to love our neighbor. It seems like such a simple command, and almost it almost sounds uh, mundane to love our neighbor, and yet, especially at times like this, it can be so hard when we have our own challenges. And so I want to encourage you to look around you in your, in your neighborhood and to truly see your neighbors, to notice how some of them may be struggling more than ever in the pandemic and simply to lift that up to God and ask him if there's anything he wants you to do. And you may be surprised to find how even in small ways he can really use you to make a difference in the lives of your neighbors. At that conference I mentioned uh, that launched the Move In movement, there was a beautiful young woman there and uh, she was sitting in the, in the front row and right in the middle, and especially during the worship, she was just loving it. You know, she was uh, just so excited about what God was doing here. And, you know, despite the hundreds of people there and the chaos of, of this event, because I had never put on a big event before. Again, I was 27 years old at the time and had never really done anything like this and that's so often how god works i noticed this beautiful young woman and in the words of george verwer i began to zoom in on the target um and i uh pursued this young woman and i told her that i wanted to get to know her and at first she rebuffed me which was good for my humility and uh but before long i had the privilege of of getting the chance to get to know her a little bit and uh, showing her the neighborhood I described earlier, bringing her, and I'm actually sitting um, on the 12th floor of my building right in my home here this morning as well, to bring her to this neighborhood. That was 2009, 2010. And, you know, things progressed in our relationship. And one day right here in this neighborhood, uh, we were outside, um, standing among these four high-rise buildings. And I said to Jesse, I said, and I, I wasn't proposing, but it was getting close. I said, Jesse, what if we got married in this neighborhood? And Jesse uh, shares now how she found that an exciting thought, first of all, because it was getting close to a proposal, but secondly, because it was just such a, a radical thought. And so at first she was very excited about it, but then she really wondered, is this a good idea? I mean, we have, we have challenges in this neighborhood. Uh, there are rival gangs. There are big dumpsters. That isn't really the best backdrop for a wedding. Um, there isn't much space. Where would we have it? There's only, there's only one patch of grass and it's caught between two of the buildings and the above ground subway train that go, roars by every two and a half minutes. We couldn't even hear ourselves 
sharing our vows. And so, of course, Jesse had some valid concerns. But one thing we recognize together is that there tends to so often be one thing that stops us from doing these kinds of exciting things. And as we looked at each of those uh, barriers and obstacles and challenges, we realized that none of them had to be a deal breaker. And so uh, Jessie shares now how she had her morning devotions the next day and God spoke to her from that passage that talks about when you throw a banquet, uh, don't throw it for those who always get invited to banquets for don't throw it for the wealthy and and well-known people that everybody wants at their parties, but throw it for the poor, the blind, the crippled, the lame, as the passage puts it in Luke. And that was the passage through which God spoke to Jesse. And you might have guessed by now that uh, things did progress. And I did a formal proposal to Jesse, and we did decide to plan to get married in the neighborhood, outside on the grass. We didn't have much in the way of money, so we couldn't really even afford big tents uh, to have the wedding under in case it rained. And so, wow, we were really having to trust God. And we gave each of the challenges to God that we had. And he uh, answered our prayers, not without additional challenges like the postal strike that happened at that very time that that didn't help us in getting our uh, invitations out by mail and other other challenges like getting permission from the landlord who owns the land to even allow us to have the wedding here and wow there was one challenge after another but god solved each of them uh, there was that one remaining challenge, though. What about that roaring train? I mean, every two to three minutes, that really could be a disruption. But we gave that to God as well. On the morning of the wedding, it was a beautiful day. And that was a good thing because we didn't have enough tents if it did rain. And, and we actually decided to have two weddings uh, so that we could have all of our family and friends and uh, so we had two full one-hour ceremony and three-hour receptions. We did that twice, four hours each time. The first in the morning, the second in the afternoon. The first wedding went incredibly well. And it was just such a joy to have about 500 people at that first wedding. And then in between weddings, we did our wedding photos and we decided to take the photos on our balcony up in the building. And it was, we were just still full of joy of how well that first wedding had gone. And then it came time for the second wedding. And when we looked down from the balcony on the wedding site, we noticed how few people there were and we got really discouraged. We said, what were we thinking? It's, it looks like everybody came to the first wedding. Uh, how foolish we were to, to do this, to try to have two weddings. And, you know, it, it was an empty site uh, minutes before the second wedding was supposed to start. But we got down on our knees and said, Lord, you did an incredible thing this morning. It was a miracle. And so we're going to just give this to you. We're going to give the second wedding to you and we're going to pray for another miracle. We postponed that second wedding 20 or 30 minutes. And by the time Jesse walked down the aisle that second time, there were more people there than at the first wedding. There were about 700 people at the second wedding. And it even included a family friendly uh, dance party with about 400 people dancing after the second four hour ceremony and reception with dinner. And so God did an incredible thing. We had a table piled with uh, Bibles that we gave out to our neighbors and to people who came. We opened it right up to our neighborhood. And it was such an incredible moment. I share this with you just to encourage you. You know, what can God do through you in your neighborhood? Whether it's giving one person a Bible, whether it's praying for someone, and maybe not even mentioning it to them. How might God use you to, to make a difference or possibly even to change a life in your neighborhood? 
It's such a privilege for each of us. I want to encourage you to do that now in the pandemic when it's maybe harder than ever because of how the pandemic is taking a toll on each of us. I want to encourage you, even in this time when it's hard for each of us, to look out and see, to truly see your neighbors and to ask God to use you. And secondly, I want to encourage you already to be thinking and dreaming beyond the pandemic because the pandemic will end. And what does God have on the other side of the pandemic? What incredible things does he want to do in your neighborhood after the pandemic? We all know that verse where there is no vision, the people perish. But the inverse of that verse is where there is vision, the people can flourish. And I want to encourage you to have that vision for your neighborhood, to mix that vision with prayer and to expect God to do incredible things in your neighborhood, now in the pandemic and afterwards. Thank you so much again for giving me the privilege to be with you virtually this morning at the Ottawa Civic Prayer Breakfast. And I hope that each of you is encouraged. May God bless you, give you a wonderful day and week, and continue to give you that hope that you need as you press into him today and in the days ahead. God bless you. What a powerful, what a powerful, inspiring, highly empowering testimony. Thank you so much, Nigel. It's so powerful. Uh, for the, thank you for sharing the way you obeyed God for the vision and for making it come to life and especially for giving us the opportunity to hear that story and um, giving us the inspiration to really tap into it during our lifetime and make it happen. I mean, uh, all of us live in a neighborhood and we need people, we have people, we see people every day. Now we have the chance to be reminded to see them prayerfully, pray for them and, and make relationship with them, especially during the pandemic mm -hmm. and especially that you give us that dream to move in. Uh, that's a powerful vision, a powerful thing that you inspire us to do. And I pray that your word has fallen onto a fertile ground and it will bear fruit in the neighborhoods across Ottawa and across Canada. Thank you so much, Nigel, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doreen. And thank you, Nigel. That was really beautiful. We've been really looking forward to our time with you, uh, gearing up for this all year. So. I'd just like to uh, close our time together with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so grateful for you. Lord, you are the maker of heaven and earth, and you see all. Lord, your word says in Genesis that you are the God who sees. And we thank you that you see us, and we thank you that uh, you want to use us in our stories wherever we are. And as Nigel said, Lord, we pray for every person listening here today um, and from this day forward that they would be hearing these words and they would be inspired, that they would indeed see uh, the people around them in their neighborhood, that they would dream about the people in their neighborhood, that they would look for uh, God-sized dreams uh, and mm. as you have called us to be your hands and feet. We pray that you would use each one of us in our, our neighborhoods where we are. Lord, we thank you that you, uh, though you are rich, you came down to be among us in our neighborhoods, to be flesh and blood. And Lord, help us to be flesh and blood to those around us. And Father, we thank you for our first responders, our medical personnel, we thank you for every person listening. Lord, this has been a hard season for so many, 
and we pray for provision for unexpected surprises for new friendships for those listening for the poor and suffering in our world that they would see your miraculous provision even as nigel talked about how you did miracles as you led them lord we're asking that you would do miracles on those in our world who are really suffering and really struggling and our first responders who have had to see things that have been so difficult and our medical personnel it's been hard but lord thank you that you are with us and we pray that you would meet their needs in miraculous way mm. so we give you the glory we thank you for your presence among us we love you in jesus name amen amen well thank you uh nigel and arlene and doreen um Thank you, Nigel. We're going, to, we're going to be coming to our Q&A time now. And um, I just, before we get there, I want to especially thank um, Arlene Borg, who was just praying, mm. and uh, the, the whole organizing team of the Prayer Breakfast, but Arlene in particular, who is the one who does so much work behind the scenes. We are uh, thankful and very grateful for you, Arlene. Um, for those of you who won't be able to join us for a Q&A, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I hope you have some valuable takeaways from our time together, and uh, may the Lord bless you. And uh, and so now we'll we'll move into our Q and A time. Um, Nigel, you ready for some hard questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, when you were uh, when you were talking about the, um, the running uh, a marathon, I've run one marathon, mm -hmm. Nigel. Um, a little bit of a runner, more of a plotter, but a little bit of a runner oh, myself. I feel but, that way uh, myself. I remember when I was running the marathon, I kept saying to myself, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm. No, no. And I take a few more steps and I say, no, no, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> but, I, yeah. but when you mentioned you were on the 12th floor, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if he would run that marathon vertically rather than just oh, wow. on, a, on a running thing? Probably, probably I'd need a bit more training for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got some questions coming in and... Um, I'm going to fire them at you, and uh, we're going to keep going here for a few minutes. So um, in your experience, how has COVID uh, more de deeply affected the poor in our cities? Mm, yeah. Well, let me zoom right out, and let's picture um, our planet hanging in space, seven and a half billion people. Um, and, you know, I've been in touch with people I'll also uh and with some things in canada but just to start with some things on the other side of the world i had the privilege of video chatting with a family in pakistan and uh seven kids in the family father's a rickshaw driver um a poor family and when the pandemic hit um nobody wanted to take a, a rickshaw taxi and so suddenly the provider of this family wasn't able to provide. And this family of seven, including a toddler, youngest child who I saw, who I, you know, was able to meet everybody in the video chat that I had, suddenly they lost their primary provider. Um, and they also have an older daughter in the family and she had gotten another job as a call center person, a remote call center person uh, for a British company in the UK, um, a phone company. And when the pandemic hit, they laid her off as well. So suddenly um, the two people with an income in this family lost their income overnight. And um, I heard about this need. And as much as I lead an organization, I felt that this was something God was calling me to make a small difference in personally. And so I spoke to my wife, Jessie, and we found out that their rent for an entire month is about 75 Canadian dollars a month. And so Jesse and I just felt that it was a no-brainer that the Lord was leading us to pay for their rent uh, for the next couple of months. And so just picture that times a million. And you get an idea of how the poorest one or two billion people in the world are being affected by the pandemic. And as I mentioned in my message, one of the great injustices of the world is that the poor are usually the hardest hit in every situation. And it's because they have the least in the way of savings. They have, they have the least in the way of safety, a safety net. 
um, all kinds of things. And wow, that gives us perspective uh, living in Canada that yes, even each of us has struggled uh, with things related to mental health and, and, you know, sudden restrictions, not being able to say family, but how that compares to this family in Pakistan and a million, actually that would be an underestimate uh, people around the world like that family. Um, wow, it gives us perspective and it, it should drive us to our knees, even, even as we um, ask God to help us with our own daily struggles. I know I'm one of those people too that um, found life harder in the pandemic. So that, that's just a global perspective. And in Canada, um, we've seen some heartbreaking things. Part, uh, Mark, you mentioned in Move In, we call our neighborhoods patches. And so we've seen some heartbreaking things in our patches. I think one of the most heartbreaking was noticing that some of the kids in our neighborhoods and our patches did not leave their apartment for four months, not a single time. And the pressure cooker of staying at home and, you know, sometimes kids don't even have words for what they're experiencing. And this was certainly the case. And again, we just were able to make a small difference. My wife, Jessie, uh, put together some craft packages, coloring books and little storybooks and things, and dropped them off to some of these homes. Um, my wife, Jessie, also set up a Facebook group, and we now have several dozen people in that group from our building and from our neighborhood. And we were able to ask people if they needed food deliveries, if they, you know, we were able to also work together. We're not the only ones giving. In fact, we're often receiving as move inners. And so we were able to work together with our neighbors and our neighbors were able to help our neighbors. And actually one of the term, you, uh, words we're starting to use instead of neighbors is loved ones who live in our neighborhoods. Somebody said, sometimes a neighbor starts out as a stranger, and then we view them more as a neighbor, and then they might become a friend, uh, but then they even might become family. And so that's something that we're experiencing in our neighborhoods as well. So yeah, tremendous um, hardship in these neighborhoods. And um, so thanks for asking, please be praying for the priority neighborhoods in, in all of our cities. And if you know a move enter, you could reach out to them to ask how you could help or even just to let them know you're praying for them. So thank you so much for that question. And um, if uh, somebody wanted to be able to help, like you're at an advantage because you have connections across the world. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps some that are watching this morning are, um, uh, they wouldn't have those connections. And so right. how, how would you, if they said, you know, if they said, yeah, I wanted to help somebody like you were talking about in, in East Asia or something, what would you suggest would be the best way for them to try and do that? Mm, that's a great question. Well, one thing that, um, you know, again, as we're all maybe even reeling ourselves in the pandemic, one thing we may not notice is that sometimes our giving goes down. And I was speaking with one of the most senior leaders for World Vision USA, which actually has, I think it's about a $2 billion budget. And I was speaking to him in the early weeks of the pandemic. And I said, you must be seeing a lot of funds pouring in right now. And he said, actually, no, it's what we've found is that giving is downstream from prosperity. And so we tend ironically to give more when everything's going well. But we need to be giving more when things are going uh, harder than usual. And so I wanna encourage everybody listening to even be aware of that, that because of our own insecurities that we face in times like these, we may reduce our giving, but I actually wanna encourage all of us to, yes, it may take a bit of courage, it might, it'll certainly take intentionality, but to uh, make, an, uh, make that effort to, to give at least as much as we do when uh, in normal times. And I would say more than we usually do because the needs are greater. Um, most of us are connected with some kind of charity. Um, give to those charities you're connected with. If you're not connected to any global charities, then uh, make that an attempt to do that. And even if 
if you're still at a loss, then I would encourage giving to the World Food Program. Um, one country that is just facing extreme hardship right now is Yemen. Um, and it's just so unjust because they're on the receiving end of a proxy war between other global powers. And uh, millions are facing starvation in Yemen. So just to highlight Yemen specifically and to recommend giving to the World Food Program for Yemen would be one uh, example. But also those personal connections we have. Do we know any missionaries? Because the whole world is facing uh, the pandemic right now. And so anybody we know in the world probably is connected with uh, the local need there and, and praying for them and giving there really makes a difference as well. Excellent. That's a great answer. Okay, I've got a few more questions coming towards you. Um, here's one. It, sa um, it reads, it is said that young people these days are less committed, but it sounds like you're seeing the opposite. Is that true? It seems to be uh, always the perception that young people are less committed. I, I think we should challenge that notion. Um, I think we are good at seeing the weaknesses of every new generation but we really miss the strengths. Um, so yeah, we're now focused on Gen Z or Gen Z, which is the, the new generation. Millennials are old news. Uh, I'm one of them. I'm 39, so I'm the oldest millennial. It goes down to about 23. And so below 23 are Gen Z or Gen Z. And they are a tremendously empathetic generation. Uh, they really feel things. They're also much more globally attuned. And that's thanks in part to one of the good things about social media um, is that we're, we're aware of more things happening around the world. That's a very good thing. Um, there's less stigma about mental health and that can give us more reality. And the, the youngest generations have the least stigma. They're the, they're the, the quickest to acknowledge um, things like mental health, um, injustices, um, you know, the, you mentioned Mark in your interview with the, with the police leader there in Ottawa, uh, the black lives matter and racial injustices that, um, have been discussed. And a lot of that is, is, is thanks to Gen Z and, and Gen Y bringing up those, uh, important conversations. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I would absolutely dispute the notion that, uh, the next generation is less committed. Um, I always have, I am always full of hope for the next generation. And I think we should even just to kind of, uh, really blow it open. I think we should even be dreaming and praying for generation alpha, which is already in the world. So Gen Z goes down to, I believe it's about five years old. So their babies born today aren't even Gen Z, they're Gen Alpha. And what might God want to do through them? Uh, when move -in started um, 11 years ago, um, people who are moving in today in 2020 were nine or 10 years old. And so we need to have vision for what's coming and to have hope. And as uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which defines hope, reminds us, one of the marks of love, or defines love, rather, is hope. We need to always hope. And when we do that, amazing things can happen. Excellent. Okay. Um, how would one start a move-in community in a city where it is not yet? Now, obviously, we have them here in Ottawa, so um, yeah. but maybe wow, there would be question. opportunities for more here, too. Yeah, so, um, so movement is a movement of about 430 people. And in that movement is a small organization called the Move-In Vision Team, which is the staff. Uh, it's only about 20 people, 25 people, and even most of them are part-time. I'm part of it. I give leadership to that. And one of the things we do is help anybody who wants to move in or to start a move in team. And for all of these 11 years, we've been doing that, uh, helping people start new teams in whole new cities, whole new countries around the world. Um, and so if you're interested in starting move in, 
in your city, just contact us at contact at movein.to. Um, if you to find MoveIn, it will probably be the first link if you simply type the word MoveIn into Google. Um, throw a couple other words on there and you'll find us pretty quickly. Uh, but again, the email address is contact at movein.to and one of us will respond and get back to you. And yeah, speaking of helping people remotely, um, one advantage we had when COVID hit in MoveIn is that we were already a virtual staff team. So we're, we're about 25 people already spread across the entire country of Canada and across the world. So our norm is already virtual. And so when you contact us virtually, we'll be uh, all set to help you and to get move in going where you are. Okay. Um, another couple of questions. Um, what's, the, what's the biggest lesson that the people in your neighborhood have taught you? And I would, I would think this might overlap with what generally do move iners experience? What lessons do they learn quickly when they move into a, uh, a needy neighborhood? Yeah, wow, that's a great question. Well, it's, it, you know, I think some move iners move in and think they're going to um, be the answer to everybody's prayer and it doesn't usually work out that way. We find when we move in and we try to educate move iners before they move in, that God is at work in these neighborhoods before we move in. And he has always been at work in these neighborhoods. And we are the lucky ones to be able to join him in that work, to join our neighbors in what they have already begun to do by God's leading. So we're just, a, we're just a couple more people getting added to the mix and we need to, to join that mix with humility. Um, some of the things I've learned is just incredible generosity and hospitality and openness. Um, neighbors, loved ones, as I say, who live in the neighborhood, uh, who will open their home more than um, some of us who've lived in Canada for a longer time might do. And I think that's a good challenge for us to say how much are our homes, our castles. And I think we need to challenge it when our homes become too much of a, a fortress and we need to push ourselves out of our comfort zones and learn from um, new Canadians and just the tremendous wealth of cultures in Canada. Um, every culture has strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's one of the beauties of coming together is that when we all have strengths and weaknesses, when we come together, we have a lot more strengths and we have a lot more weaknesses, which gives us humility, but the strengths of others uh, makes up for those weaknesses. And so we all have something to bring. And I just wanna encourage everybody to not feel unqualified or disqualified with humility and with prayer, we all have something we can bring. Um, and yeah, related to that, um, we need to be, I like that question. It, it's the right question because we need to um, have an attitude of, wow, God even wants me to be a recipient, to be on the receiving end of giving. And as Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so when we receive, we are, get, we are um, allowing someone else to give, which is a blessing for them. Um, it's a blessing either way. So I hope that's an encouragement to everybody. Maybe just one more question. Um, what, uh, what risks around your family's safety have you had to trust God with? Um, has, that been, has that been a challenge for you and Jesse and your young family to, to walk through? I'm reminded of that verse that says, uh, perfect love casts out fear. And I'm reminded of it because, and I'll, I'll share why I bring that up, because we've noticed that the fears of the dangers in these high needs neighborhoods are far greater, so that the fears are far greater than the actual dangers. Um, so before somebody moves into a high needs neighborhood, their imagination gets going 
and they think of all those headlines and different things on the worst parts of the news. And it really isn't an accurate um, representation. Um, we've had move vendors move into some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world. So we have a team in the most dangerous city in Mexico City. Uh, but even there, the dangers are far less, far fewer than sometimes our fears. And so, yes, there are dangers. Um, I think, you know, yeah, um, when I think in our neighborhoods, uh, folks face greater challenges, they face greater barriers to employment, um, they have less generational wealth. And so that will, that will be a, cause pressure. And sometimes that pressure uh, results in greater mental health challenges, greater relational difficulties. And so sometimes these things can be noticed in the neighborhood. But we are really, in Canada for the most part, we are not at much risk at all. And so we can get on with the work of, um, of loving people and of being loved by people in our neighborhoods. Um, of course, uh, it's good to grow in knowledge, but I, I, and so, you know, as soon as move inners move in, they realize, okay, you may not want to walk down that particular path after dark or so on, but you know what? Most of the dangers are far less than the fears. And um, maybe there's application for that truth in all of our lives, wherever we live and, and in whatever, whatever spheres we're in. I think we named our first son Courage um, because we recognized even in our, our lives that we really need more courage. We need to get past those fears. We need to apply that verse to our lives where perfect love drives out fear. And when that fear gets driven out, uh, then we become that much more available to be used by God. Um, hey, I wanted to mention something in the wedding story. I mentioned that roaring train and uh, for those of you who've stuck around till now, you get to hear the end of that story, which is on the day of the wedding, amazingly, um, there was construction on the train track, uh, just about 100 meters up, and it caused all of the trains to have to slow down and creep by, uh, crawl by quietly our wedding site. And so we, God even answered that prayer. And I hope that's an encouragement to each of you here right now um, to just have courage, even if there are risks, and uh, to ask God to replace those fears with that perfect love that drives out fear. Excellent. Thank you for, uh, for that. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning. Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Um, you know, I think my takeaways from this is that... Um, each, every one of us has a role to play to mm. be uh, invested somehow in mm. uh, the lives of the poor, either mm. in our communities or around the world. And um, mm -hmm. that's a challenge uh, that I'm taking away from this. And uh, that I, I love the phrase you used, you know, pause, look out, notice your neighbor, uh, mm. love your neighbors, you know, bring them from, from neighbors to friends, to family, to loved mm -hmm. ones, bring them mm -hmm. close. Um, Bring them into your house. Um, mm. You know that's a real challenge for me and for Canadians. I think mm -hmm. so. Um, can I just uh, finish off by praying? It is a prayer Absolutely. breakfast. Absolutely. Yeah. That would be appropriate. Absolutely. And so uh, thank you everybody for for uh, for for being with us this morning, and um, we're hoping that next year we can do this in person. Mm. Um, it's a uh, it's wonderful to be around tables with one another and to be in a room where. Uh, you know, so much more is going on, and we get to have a really nice breakfast. Yeah. So Lord. Um, thank you for Nigel and for Jesse. Thank you, Father, for uh, their obedience in walking out uh, that vision. And uh, Lord, I just love it. You are such a loving God that on the day they get married, uh, you slow the trains down so mm, it's not mm -hmm. too loud for them. That's mm -hmm. the kind of God you are. And so we, we love you. We, we worship you. Lord, we know your heart is uh, for, for the poor of this world. And I pray that you would mm. break our hearts. Lord, Lord, I pray that we give you permission. We'd invite mm -hmm. you 
to break our hearts for those who uh, live some in, some in desperate need and that, Lord, you would use us, you'd use every one of us, Lord, to play a role in fulfilling that need and uh, in, in seeing your kingdom come in this world. And so we pray this all this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm, amen. Have a, uh, have a good morning, everybody, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. God bless you all. God bless each of you.